start the recording. Okay. So good evening, everybody. This evening session is going to be our introduction to radar session. We're going to run for about 35 minutes or so. Uh, so if I can just pop my slides on here for you. <clears throat> okay. So this evening, um, what we're going to have a look at is introduction to radar. So radio aid for determining direction and range. Okay. Um, if I can just ask you if you are not muted, if you can just pop yourselves on mute, that would be far. I think I can do a couple of four. We, there we go. If I can just pop you on mute, fabulous. Okay. So we're going to look at an introduction to radar. So for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, Kat Scott. I'm the chief instructor here at Compass Sea School based in Porter's Head, just near Bristol. I'm a Yacht Master Instructor Power. I'm also an Advanced Power Boat Instructor and a Radar Instructor, amongst other things. Um, and teaching small boats, big boats, and once upon a time was a sailor. So I do love a sailing boat. I do love racing, um, but I got a little bit old for racing and my body wasn't quite prepared to cash the checks that I wanted it to for racing anymore. But so hopefully coming at it from all sides of the house, from sailing, motorboating and power boating. OK, so what are we going to have a look at tonight? This is the session's objectives for this evening. We're going to have a look at how our radar works. <clears throat> so what is in the box? What what does it actually do? How does it work? And if we can start understanding how it works, then we can start understanding what the returns are that we will get on the screen. We're going to have a look at our limitations of radar. Um, so it's great having this all seeing eye and everybody says it's a magic eye that can see through fog, it can see through the dark, it can, you know, see all sorts of places, but actually there are some important limitations that um, I'd like to make you aware of so that you don't think it's a magic fix all. Okay. We're also going to take a look at some simple radar setup. So I'll pop one of our radar simulators up and show you just how we can go through on our simple radar setup. Okay. And also what we'll be looking at is an introduction to broadband radar. So perhaps for those of you for, uh, that's new to some of you, so not just using a traditional radar, but how the broadband radar market is starting to change how we can better use some of the radar on board our vessels. And that's more from the, um, the not necessarily the commercial side of it, but the pleasure sailing side of it as well. Um, as ever, there is a bit of a quiz. So I've got a quiz towards the end. So hopefully you're paying attention as we go. OK, nice, simple quiz, though. Alrighty. So first up then, what we're going to have a look at is the basic system components of our radar screen. OK, and effectively, no matter what, no matter how clever our radar is, no matter how big our radar is, it is effectively made up of these things on the left hand side here. OK, so we have our antenna and our antenna could be a dome. It could be one of the smaller domes that you see, or it could be a big open scanner array. But we have our antenna, which is attached to our transmit and receive switch because our radar can only do one thing at once. It can only either transmit or receive. So it has our clever switch in here to switch between the two. On one side, we've got our transmitter, which is sending our microwaves out through our antenna. So it's dispatching microwaves out in a particular direction at a particular speed, and it's waiting for them to come back to say they ran into something. So they bumped into something and they came back. When they come back then, they're popping themselves down into the receiver, and our receiver is then going to do all the clever thinking about what came back, where it came back from, how long it took to come back, and therefore what that receiver is going to display on our plan position indicator, our PPI. So this is the radar display. Depending on your vessel, you may well have um, an individual display for the radar. It may be um, jointly with another display. So it might be a choice on your chart plotter, whether you display your chart plotter or your radar, um, or it could be something where you have a radar overlay. But either way, we've got our transmitter, which is sending our microwaves out through the antenna, the antenna turning through 360 degrees. So firing all of our microwaves out at a particular speed and a particular uh, a particular speed in a particular direction and then it's spending a the vast majority so 99 but more than 99 percent of its time listening so it's sending those transmissions out and then the radar is listening and it's listening for those microwaves to come back once they come back into the receiver then they're then being put onto the display and depending on what type of radar you have will depend on what sort of display you're going to get okay but this is effectively the basis of any of the systems that you would have you can have an hd radar which is going to give you an hd display for example but it's still doing the basic fundamentals 
as things are starting to change, what we're finding is that the ability to take that picture and put it onto a display is becoming easier and therefore we're able to do more things with it. But the fundamentals of what your radar is actually doing is transmitting and receiving. Okay, so in this top instance here, we're transmitting out our red pulses, we're receiving so transmitting out our green pulses, we're receiving back our red pulses, and it's showing us where the target is. We have our emitted wave and our reflected wave. Down at the bottom here in this little caption here, what you'll see is this is my radar sending out quite a strong green signal. So that initial signal is quite a strong green signal. And when it hits its target and it bounces back, in this case, you'll see my green is turning into blue and the blue ones are a lot smaller than the green ones. So what is actually coming back is not necessarily anywhere near as strong as it was when it went out, okay? And the radar is then making decisions based on the strength, the direction, and how quickly it took that particular signal to come back <clears throat> as to what it displays on this plan position indicator on the left-hand side. The stronger the return, the more likely it is going to be showing you a better quality target or better quality return on your actual screen okay so no matter what kind of system you have it's the basics of your transmitter receiver switching between the transmit and the receive switch onto the antenna so that it can receive the information and do something with it depending on how clever your system may be okay so that's the basic fundamentals of how it works what we need to think about is how is it going to get me a return? Because our top one here is our horizontal beam width. So if we're looking down onto this vessel here, we've got our open scanner array on the top and we have a horizontal beam width. Okay, And depending on how wide our antenna is will depend on how wide our beam width is. So the smaller the antenna, the wider the beam width. The larger the antenna, so in this case, we've got quite a large array here on the top the shorter the beam width or the, the smaller the beam width, okay? Because we've got more power and we can target better, but we're looking at a horizontal beam width on an average cruising vessel. So if we're talking about anywhere between a 30 centimeter, 45 centimeter radome, so typically on smaller ribs, on yachts perhaps, all the way up to perhaps some of the open scanner arrays up to perhaps even sort of three feet, we're looking at anything from a horizontal beam width of around six degrees down to about two degrees. OK, now the smaller the beam width, the more targeted your radar will be. And the easiest way I get my students to think about this is the wider beam width. So a six degree beam width is a bit like we're firing beach balls out of our radar system. OK, we're firing beach balls. So the beach balls will hit the target and come back. As we start to move down those beam widths, we're going to make the ball smaller. So the balls perhaps become um, a basketball or a football, all the way down to a tennis ball and maybe even down to a ping pong ball if it's a much smaller horizontal beam width down at sort of, say, two degrees. So if you think if I was to throw a beach ball at something or a ping pong ball, the ping pong ball is going to give me a much more accurate return of the things that it would hit. Imagine you were throwing a beach ball into a very narrow doorway, the beach ball would get stuck. Okay, so it would tell you that there was a whole thing there. Whereas if I fired lots of little ping pong balls, they would tell me where the door jam was, they would tell me where the gap was, and they would tell me where the door jam was. So the larger my array, the smaller my horizontal beam width, and that's going to give me a much better return. Okay, but there are other consequences. It's going to need power to, to, to make it work and so on. So we're tending for the vessels, if we're looking at normal pleasure craft, around anything between six down to two degrees. And as my horizontal beam width sweeps round, as well as my horizontal beam width, so how far out in front of me, if you like, that beam width is going, I also have my vertical beam width. So on this particular <clears throat> instance here, my vertical beam width is showing in around about 20, 25 degrees, okay? And in 20, 25 degrees, what I'm looking at is an ability to see things as they move away from my vessel. But already one of the limitations that you would be able to see here is, what if I had something <clears throat> that was sitting right here? So if I just pop, bear with me, if I pop. 
something like we were next to a boy, for example, if we were next to a boy, we wouldn't be picking this up on our radar because the vertical beam width is sweeping a little bit further out from our vessel. Okay, so we've got a dead zone, if you like, within our actual vessel. Okay. So we've got to worry about our horizontal beam width, and we've also got to worry about our vertical beam width. And this vertical beam width here is showing a vessel that is fairly upright. Okay, If we're now looking at using this on a vessel in the big sea where our vessel is pitching and rolling, or we're looking at having our sailing boat heeled over, then the beam width is obviously going to move as the vessel moves. Okay, so as well as our horizontal beam width here, we can worry about our vertical beam width as well in order to try and get the best return that we can get. Okay. So here we've got a couple of examples for you. So here's a typical, uh, this typical Ray Marine antenna width here. We're looking at about 50 centimetres. So reasonably you would find this perhaps on a motor cruiser. You could find it on a pole at the back of a, a yacht, perhaps or up the mast of a yacht. And we're looking at around about five degrees for our horizontal beam width and around about 25 degrees for our vertical beam width. The vertical beam width doesn't really change very much as you can see between the two, but there's a huge difference between that horizontal beam width. So how accurately it's firing out those particular microwaves. There's also quite a difference in the range. So our max range here on what would be sort of a smaller boat radar, if you like, we're looking at a max range of 48 nautical miles. Whereas when we start getting into the open scanner arrays, we're looking at a maximum range of about 72 nautical miles, okay? There's other things we need to consider, which I'll come on to as to literally how far we can really see. But what we do need to think about is what we are fitting onto our vessel and what it's going to be able to show us. So in this top drawing here, We've got a vessel that's got an open scanner array, let's say it's got a two degree beam width as opposed to our rib down at the bottom, which has got a five degree beam width. And if they were looking at the same entrance, perhaps this is an entrance, so a couple of bits of land here, we've got an entrance going up into a harbour, let's say. The top vessel is going to get a return from both of these, whereas the rib is just going to see that even if it hits one side or the other of the headland, the return will come back and say there is a thing in front of you. So our displays then will be very different, okay? So our display at the top here will give us a return of two individual returns because it's a bit like firing ping pong balls. So it's gonna give us a much better return on there. Whereas our rib down at the bottom here is going to give us a single display because it's the return has gone, the, the beam width has gone out, the pulse has gone out, it hits something. So it's come back to the system and said, there is something out there, okay? It's not able to discriminate between the fact that it's actually hit sort of an opening because it's hit a thing. So it's fairly, it's a fairly dumb pulse. It's come back and said, there is a thing right there that you need to worry about, okay? So the beam width makes quite a big difference. But then what are the limitations? Well, number one limitation of any radar system is you, okay? Because the system does what the system does, okay? You're gonna turn it on, you're going to warm it up, you're gonna put it into, into transmit. And how you deal with the system, the picture you are looking at, what ranges you are looking at, what you are doing with it, and how you interpret it are probably one of the biggest limitations, okay? So that's one of our first limitations, okay? What we set up on our screen and how we set our screen up is screen up, I mean, is one of our other limitations. Okay, so what are the decisions that we are making? When you look at this picture, what does it tell you? Do you see some land? Do you see vessels with some wakes? What is this green dot here? When we look at that individual screen, we can't just make an assumption unless we're tallying it with a chart to say, I know that that is land. I know that that is a vessel. These things over here could be all sorts of things until we actually start to look at the picture unfold okay and then how you set your set your station up and how well or the size if you like of your screen as well a larger screen is going to give you a much better ability to see what is going on on the screen if you've got a much smaller screen it's going to make your life a lot more complicated so I would say the limbic by, by far one of the biggest limitations is you the decisions that you make and how you interpret what you see <clears throat> One of the other limitations that we have then, if I just move this up at the top here, one well, of the other limitations that we have are our little tugboat over here, and we've got the curvature of the earth, okay? In the same way that we talk about VHF radios having a particular distance that they can travel, we've got the same thing to consider about our radar. So if we fire our radar, if you like, from our vessel, we have a radar horizon. And in this case, the beam is going fairly straight. So underneath here, 
we're not bending that beam all the way around, okay? There are different weather patterns that can start to bend it. So if we have a particularly high pressure system, it can start to give us some, some bend in the radar horizon. It might see a little bit further, but there are still things beyond that particular horizon that the radar isn't going to pick up unless they are relatively big things, okay? And one of the activities we do on our radar workshop is look at actually understanding how far away you can be from things before you can see it. Because I told you a couple of slides ago, your radar can see for perhaps 72 miles or 48 miles, and it can, but it can't necessarily see a teeny tiny boy, which is perhaps a meter or two high at that kind of distance and show it on your screen. So how far beyond the horizon our radar can see is quite an important limitation. Down at the bottom here then, where our radar is placed and other things that can get in the way, have quite a big impact as well. So we've got a large container vessel here, likely to have one of its ship's radars high up on the superstructure. But again, it's only going to be able to see the yacht. It's not going to be able to see the motorboat because if the radar beam comes any further down, it's just going to be hitting the front of the ship. Okay. So in this instance, we're looking at a vessel that can only see something on radar some distance from the ship. Anything in here will be invisible. And what a lot of some of the larger vessels are doing now is having a second radar. Okay. So actually having a second radar where you could see something a little bit closer in. Because otherwise, if we were trying to lower this particular radar one, we would just end up with getting a whole load of returns from the stack. Okay. And that would be skewing the, the picture that we would be seeing. Similarly, if we're putting our radar onto a yacht, then depending on what your mast is made of, is going to depend on whether the radar beams can go through it or not. So we may well potentially have our radar set forward of the mast with a radar blind arc behind us. Okay, and I'll come on to in a second what's going to give us some good returns and what's not. So again, as well as you as the limitation, what we're going to have a look at is to say where the thing is, okay, depending on where it is, depends on what we're actually going to be able to see, okay. So here's our little tugboat again, depending on how the sweep happens, um, radar can't really see round corners, okay, these are fairly straight waves that we're sending out. So we send out our first wave. This first wave is going to give us a return off the nearest thing that it comes to, okay, depending on our pulse length. But we're looking at getting a radar return perhaps from this um, starboard lateral buoy here rather than perhaps the port hand buoy there because the returns will have bumped into the buoy and come back to tell us, okay. As we start to sweep our radar around, then this will give us a return perhaps from the buoy um, on the far side of the channel. Again, this one, this radar, as we sweep it round, it's going to give us a return off this large container ship because it's, you know, it's the biggest thing in town, really. What it's not going to be able to do is hop over the top of the container ship and go, oh, well, there's a boy in a ship and a little yacht behind it as well. OK, so what we will get onto our radar picture is a more of an idea of, yes, there is a large ship there, but the things behind it will be masked by the large ship. As it comes around to meet the headland then, once we get swept into the headland, if this was a fairly large headland, we've got all of this activity going on behind the headland and we wouldn't be able to see that return on the radar. If this was a flat area, then we would. But actually, if this was just a large area, um, so a large uh, protruding headland, we wouldn't have any idea on our radar picture that there were any other vessels or anything going on behind the headland. So it cannot see around corners. When you couple it with something like an AIS, if any of these yachts perhaps had AIS on, then yes, we would be able to put that picture together with our radar picture. But don't rely on just your radar being able to see around corners because it can't. So what are we going to get a good return from? Well, I use the acronym MASTS. So I look at the material, the aspect, the size, the texture, and the shape, okay? So what material is the thing made from? If it is a good conductor of electricity, it will probably give me quite a good return on the radar screen. So metal and water. If it's a poor conductor, of electricity, so something like wood, something like GRP, um, it's going to give me a poor return. 
If I look at the aspect then, depending on which way it is facing and how much of those pulses it's sending back to me, that will depend on what I get back on my picture. So if I look at something facing the pulse, so if I was alongside a large headland, for example, or a large wall, if I was facing the pulse, I would get a really good return. If I was oblique, so if maybe I was just looking at the bow of a boat, or maybe I was looking at the corner of something, the picture isn't going to be quite such a good return. Generally, large things are better than small things. Okay, larger things are giving those microwaves a better chance of hitting it or coming back to it. And what the texture is, if it is a rough texture, it's likely to give me a much better return than a smooth texture. I'm sure we've all seen stealthy aircraft and stealthy ships. They all have a particularly smooth texture. They also have a curved texture. And if you look where we have down at the ball here, the ball and this particular cone is going to reflect the radar away. If it reflects it away and it doesn't send it back, then your plan position interface and your receiver can't do anything about it because it's gone somewhere else. So something that is um, large metal facing you, with a rough surface or a flat surface is going to be a much, give you a much better return. So think masts when you're thinking about how, um, what kind of returns you could get. You've got some ideas on shape at the bottom here, okay? And these are the octahedral shapes. So this is a more traditional radar reflector perhaps that you could hoist. And you'll see it's set in rain catcher mode. So if I was to put it on my vessel, it would catch the rain as the rain fell. And you can see that on this particular picture in the middle, it shows you how the radar waves would go in, beam around it and come straight out. So that's how your traditional radar reflectors are working, particularly when they have the octahedral shape. Um, the, no matter pretty much how the radar hits it, it will go in, bounce and come back out again and hopefully give you some sort of a return on your radar screen. So here is the quick quiz for you. I'm gonna put some pictures up and what I want you to do is have a think about which of these would show you the best return which of these would show you the worst return? So think masts, think what they're made of, okay? So think what material it is, the size and so on and so forth. So if I just, if we resume recording, if we start off then looking at our really large container ship here, we're actually looking at the bow of it. So although it is still big and it's still made of really good material, it's going to give us a slightly different return looking bow on than if perhaps we were coming down the side of it. Okay, so we'll get a smaller return, but you betcha it will be a really good return. Okay. If we think then, what do we think would be the worst return? What are you thinking for the worst return then? Do you want to pop it into the chat or <clears throat> let's see what we're coming up with? Uh, nice. So we're all going for E. We're all going for our little chap in his uh, canoe. Okay, kayak, canoe, never really sure which ones they are. I'm sure there'll be someone out there who's happy to correct me. Okay, But yeah, so this chap, is there really anything for those, re those, those microwaves to really bounce off and come back? They're going to go straight through. Thank you, kayak. <laughs> They're going to go straight through um, the, the person. We're looking at them going straight through the kayak. So we're going to get almost no return whatsoever from E. Okay, so B at the top of the tree, E at the bottom of the tree. What are we thinking about A, C, D and F then? Okay, if we start with B at the top, what would you think would be the next best return? Are we looking at A, C, D or F? So we've got some Ds, some Cs. Okay, so this is interesting. So we've got some Ds and some Cs. Okay, so if we look at this being a steel boat so this is a steel hold boat so plenty of steel for the radar to get its uh, its teeth into if you like d down here made a grp realistically what are we going to get a return from on that motor yacht the grp is going to be not particularly helpful and if we look at comparing our steel yacht return to our motor yacht return these are almost a stealthy boat okay we're looking at some good metal in there so we're perhaps looking at some sort of return from maybe some of the engine block if we're lucky but unless we have a radar reflector on there we're probably not going to get a particularly good return so I'd start with B as my most reflective. I'd go to C, my steel yacht, as my next reflective. And then I'm into a choice between A, D, and F. I'm pretty sure that E down at the bottom. Although what about A? A is just a wooden hulled boat. 
So is there really anything for the radar to give me a return from? Very, very little. When we look at our rib then, we've got bits and pieces of metal perhaps on the rib, but again, without a radar reflector, it's going to be quite difficult to spot. So although you might think, you know, oh, you could have a much larger motor yacht, you could do, but unless there is some real metal, if you like to get hold of for those radio waves, they're not gonna be other microwaves, they're not gonna be able to send it back. So ideally we'd start at the top with B as our best return, then perhaps have a look at C, then depending on whether there's a radar reflector on, I'd probably go for D, then I'd go for F, then I'd probably go for A and E being right down at the bottom. Okay, so that's how we would rank them using a standard radar set. Broadband radar is a fairly new invention and broadband, nothing to do with the fact that you've got broadband in your home. Okay, it's just looking at using a different type of functionality. So we've got our top up at the top here. And one of the main issues we have with our radio is uh, our, our radar is the radiation hazard that we have from it. Our broadband radar doesn't have a radiation hazard. So you can go cuddle your radar if you have a broadband radar, okay? If it's feeling a little bit lonely and you wanted to give it a cuddle, you can give it a cuddle. But down at the bottom here, I've also got an idea of a broadband picture. And what we can see is our broadband picture is a lot better. It's given a lot more discrimination. It's able to pick things up. And how does it do it? Well, it works using a frequency modulated continuous wave, which gives us a nice clear image. It's also got two antennas, one transmitting and one receiving. But some of the biggest benefits are particularly where I'm looking at having no warm up, and I'll show you a warm up in a second. I have no warm up, it's instant on. There is nothing for the, uh, the microwaves, there's, there's no reason for any microwaves to get warmer for the, for the magnetron to warm up. So this is instant on, so I've got a much better um, facility if the fog drops and I want to turn it on immediately. They tend to be smaller in size, but the power requirements that they pull are a lot less than a traditional radar, okay? So about 30% less power when it is transmitting and almost nothing in standby. That's a lot less than my average power for a standard radar, okay? Zero rad has, which makes it, like I say, cuddleable. And we have some safer transmission levels as well. We're down at a fifth of the common mobile phone. So a fifth of a watt is what we're actually firing from a transmission levels. There are some limitations to my broadband radar, though. It is unlikely to pick up Raycon, SART or other active radar transponders because you're using a different set of technology. And its effective range is much lower. It's down at 16 miles. OK, so we have a broadband radar on board our motor cruiser. OK, it works very well for the areas that we are operating operating in some real big things that it picks up are things that wouldn't pick, be picked up on traditional radars. So it also can pick up um, PVC, it would be picking up motor yachts, it would be picking up things that, like say a traditional radar wouldn't necessarily pick up. So if you have the opportunity to have a play with broadband radar, then it's also very good. And the discrimination that you can see on the picture down here is also showing you a vessel that's coming into a harbour. And these on the left will be uh, boats that it is picking up. So it's giving you a much clearer picture. So how do we actually set our radar up and close it down? OK, I'm going to pop our simulator on in just a second, but I just want to take you through this screen. So if you want to set your radar to on, you need to power it on and they tend to need a warm up period of around two to three minutes. That gets the magnetron warmed up. That sets your transmit and receive a bit like <coughs> warming up any kind of device. Um, and then you can pop it into transmit until you pop it into transmit. It's just sitting there ready. It's not actually doing anything. OK, so at the top here, we've got a radar picture of warming up. And once we pop it into transmit, we're actually then firing our microwaves out. Now, a traditional old, well, sorry, a more old fashioned radar, you would tend to have to set this up. Some of the new radars have auto set up, okay? but it's always useful to know how you could perhaps get a better picture. So most importantly, we're going to look at the brilliance. How bright is that picture? Why am I interested? If I'm on a particular sunny day, I might need much more brightness on the screen. If I'm out operating at night, I absolutely don't want a huge load of brightness on the screen because it's just going to ruin my night visibility. I can play with the gain, which is adjusting the sensitivity. This shows you the gain fully up on a screen on the right hand side here. I also then can play with the range, which alters the range rings and varies my pulse length and my interval, which means that I can see more of the picture at a longer range. And then I can have a look at the tuning where I'm matching my frequency of my sent and received pulses. OK, I then 
play with the radar, I have a look at what's it's, what it's doing. And then when I want to close it down, I put it into standby before I power it off. So I give it a chance of closing itself down before I actually turn the power off or power on, okay? And the way I remember it is BGRT, Britain's Got Reasonable Talent, okay? Although sometimes on a Saturday night, Britain really doesn't have very much talent at all, but Britain's Got Reasonable Talent. So that's what I would be remembering from that, okay? So if I just resume the recording. Okay, so this is one of the uh, radar simulators that we use. This is a horizon uh, simulator. This is, sorry, this is our uh, Lightmaster simulator. And we have this, as uh, this is our personal copy of the simulator. And what I can show you is down at the bottom here, I've got my on off switch. So I'm going to put it into warming up. This one only gives me a 10 second warm up because it's not real, it's just a simulator. But effectively this is the radar setting itself up, warming up the magnetron and now being ready to transmit if that's what I want it to do. So before I press transmit, it is drawing power, but it's not actually doing anything right now. So it isn't firing up those microwaves. It is just waiting to do that. So if I pop it into transmit, then what you'll see is I start to get some different elements onto my screen, okay? I've got my brilliance up here, so I can turn the brilliance all the way down, okay? And the picture pretty much disappears. And what I want to do is to set my brilliance I'll set it right the way up so it should be a nice bright picture for you guys. I set my brilliance so that I have all of the screen and this is more like an old fashioned television would be, you know, you could actually set the brilliance on an old fashioned television, it's not so much I guess now, but certainly on an old fashioned television you can set that brilliance as to how bright you want the picture. I haven't done anything to the radar yet, all I have set is how bright that picture is going to be. I can then start to take a look at my gain, my gain on the second left hand button here, um, if I turn the gain all the way up, effectively, that is getting all of the returns, okay? And obviously with that, that's just washing the whole picture out. So what I want to do is set my gain such that I get rid of most of these speckles, but perhaps just leave some of the speckles. So I turn it all the way up. And then what I want to do is I want to start just reducing the gain down. Again, that's got quite a lot of speckle on the screen. So perhaps I'm just going to set it to about there, okay? I don't wanna turn it down too far. If I remove all of the speckles, then I'm removing some of the returns and there's potential returns that I'm missing. So perhaps for this, I'm just gonna set it to these speckles. So at the moment, what I'm looking at is I'm on a range, uh, a range of about half a nautical mile. My range rings are set to a quarter of a nautical mile. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna range out and I'm gonna have a look at where in the world I am. So here, if I range out again, I can start to see the picture starting to display. I'll leave that just because I know it takes a little while for it to catch up over Zoom. So I can start to see some different bits and pieces appearing on my screen here, okay? I've got what could be some land popping up at the top here. I've got what could be some land just behind me and then some interesting returns. That looks an interesting return. That one's just turned itself into quite a big return. But again, when I look at this picture, what I can't do is make a decision on what I'm seeing. I need to let some of that picture play out. So I set my ring. So I'm going to try and think, well, I'm actually in the Solent. I'm just, so this is cows just here. So I'm just going to come down on the rings. Let's have a look. I'm going to go to about two nautical miles. So I set my range where I can see various things and I'm going to have a play with the tuning. So here's my tuning button over on the left hand side. And effectively, if I tune it all the way down again, like you would have tuned an old fashioned television, <clears throat> okay, I want to try and tune it in for the best picture. So right down at the bottom, you can immediately see that right down here, I'm not getting as good a return as I was. So what I want to do is have a bit of a play with the tuning. Effectively, I'm trying to get as many of these tuning bars at the top here um, into full bars as I can. So let me pop it up to here. And already you can see that that picture is a much clearer picture than the one that I was displaying a second ago. Okay. My other controls over the left hand side here deal with the clutter, that's for a separate session. But what I can see now is that I've got my range set at two nautical miles. It doesn't mean that my radar has stopped looking further. It just means that that's all I'm displaying on the screen. I can range out all the way to 16 nautical miles on this particular screen, but there's no point. If I'm in the Solent, the vast majority of this picture is now land. Okay, so it's not a helpful picture for me. 
If I range back down again, if I come back down to say two nautical miles in this particular picture, that's giving me an idea of uh, a range rings at half a nautical mile. So this first range ring here, half a nautical mile, there are already three interesting things within half a nautical mile of me. In a, any kind of radar picture, I am at the center of the picture. So at the moment I'm in head up display, I'm on a heading of 140 degrees, as you can see from the outside bevel. So I have actually got some things behind me. I'm heading down into cows and I have got some things in front of me. These things could be boys, they could be vessels, they could be all sorts of things, okay? And I've got this interesting thing over here, which looks a little bit like uh, one of the shingle banks, I think it is. So I can set my screen up so it gives me the best picture. I can change various things on my heading and so on and so forth. I can turn my range rings on and off, okay? We go into a little bit more about that in our radar workshop, okay? So once I've set this up, one of the interesting things, if I take my radar rings off, my range rings off, I can have my variable range marker and my electronic bearing line. These are some of the simplest tools that you can use if you're looking to use your radar for anti-collision. My variable range marker here, I can make that ring grow. So I can look at it and say, well, the edge of this bank here is sitting out at 1.3 nautical miles. So I can use that as a, a range ring that I can grow and shrink as opposed to the range rings that are fixed here, okay? But as I change my range, you'll see if I range out to four nautical miles, my range rings then change to one nautical mile, okay? Various other bits and pieces, I've got my marker again and my guard zone over here, but again, they're for a different session. So that's what my picture starts to look like. I've set it up to be as good a picture as I think I can be. Things I can change are my brilliance. I can change the gain. I don't want to send the gain down too far because then I'm potentially missing targets that are coming back or missing returns that are coming back. My tuning, I'm trying to make this the best picture. You saw when I tuned it right down here, already that picture is starting to look a lot less clear than it was just a second ago. My tuning bars have changed. So if I pop it back up to this one here, this was about the best tuning I think I could get for this picture. Okay, I can change the range and actually my picture is looking quite good so that if I could reasonably start to look at this, tally it with my chart and start to say, okay, I'm expecting there to be a vessel or I'm expecting there to be a boy, um, a beamers or on the nose or whatever it happens to be. And I will be able to start my vessel heading off down into cows. How do I go about turning the radar off then? So when would I want to turn it off if I came up alongside another vessel? Um, if I was coming into a harbour, I don't need to zap everybody as I come into the harbour. So again, with this, I'd be looking at popping it into transmit, standby. So popping it into standby, the radar is still on, but it is no longer firing the microwaves out. So it's ready to go but it's not actually drawing that extra power to fire the microwaves out. And once I've done that, then I would be easily able, once it's gone um, into standby and it's happy, I would be able to power the radar off. So, running back on. Okay, so, Oh, there we go. I thought I had the objectives. My apologies, I don't have the objectives. Um, next sessions that we have are our light characteristics session, which is on Thursday this week at uh, seven o'clock, which is one of our free sessions. And if you would like to know more, we have a virtual radar workshop running, which is 9.30 till 12.30 this Saturday, which uses our simulator, goes into a lot more depth about the tools, the techniques, how you can best use your radar. And that is one of the sessions that we've got set up. And that is a 60 pound session bookable through our website. OK, so hopefully this evening, what I have given you, bear with me, if I go stop share, if 